بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم Welcome listeners to the latest Talking Dean podcast I am your host Majid and today I have my co-host Brother Rush and also a special guest um, He's special anyway, normally you say that for someone who doesn't come often but I've got to say he's special is Brother JK uh, aka Talking Sura uh, So yeah inshallah guys it's been a while uh, people have been asking what's happening talking talking Dean have they uh, have they given up is there anything to worry about no alhamdulillah <laughs> nothing to worry about you know all of us got to take a, you know some side things on now and again so okay alhamdulillah alhamdulillah yeah that's good so so you know we've not given up we're still on the scene yes. um it's just that you know part of the crew is uh, on holiday somewhere hence why this is purely an audio podcast today so um you won't be able to see uh, uh the Mubarak face of Rush and uh, <laughs> and brother JK, but uh, but yeah, so inshallah we've got a, a really important topic today, uh, something which has to be spoken about, uh, especially in our times. A lot of people do speak about it, uh, but you know even use Sharia evidences. But I feel that you know uh, the whole viewpoint and the whole the way they're looking at it might be wrong. So sometimes mm-hmm. the uh, the end result isn't always correct. Okay, so today we're going to speak about politics, um, and we want to speak about the Messenger of Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, whether he was a politician, and also we want to link this to you know the uh, uh, upcoming elections. Even though the podcast isn't restricted to just say the British elections, it just just so happens that they they're coming up at the moment and people are speaking about this in Britain anyway. Mm. But this applies really to uh, uh, all democratic elections. In fact. You could argue that it, it you know, applies to even the Muslim countries mm-hmm. where the Sharia of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not being implemented. Okay, mm-hmm. So the reason why uh, we want to speak about politics and was the messenger a politician. Um, I mean, I did a, uh, I did a poll on in- Instagram mm-hmm. and it was, a, it was almost 50-50. More people said that uh, the, the messenger sallam, was a politician, but almost half said he wasn't. Mm-hmm. And I think the reason why is because politics is seen as a dirty thing. And a politician is seen as someone who's cunning, who you know who uh, claims too many expenses, and especially if you watch Bollywood movies, you know it's pure just just purely a sellout. Okay, mm-hmm. um, so that's why I think that a lot of Muslims what they do is they really want to um, keep Islam away from the word politics and even the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. For them, it's almost blasphemy to call him a politician. So inshallah, let's start on this point. Okay, so the question I'll throw out, throw out to you guys is, was the, was the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, was he a politician? So I think uh, the first, in order to answer that question, firstly, let's define what is politics. So, um, because a lot of people will have certain um, definitions in their minds of what politics is based on their experience and based on what they've seen and grown up with. Um, so in West, uh, Western society, uh, we have one view of pol- politics mm-hmm. because actually... The framework is, you know, is, is set a, a certain way, and in Islam we have a, a slightly different um, definition. You could you could argue, or generally, uh, we follow the the purer term of what politics means. And what what it means, in my view, is that to look after the affairs of the people. So a politician is about taking care of the, his people, representing his people, and you know, serving his people. So he looks after the affairs of the people, or governs the people's interests. So based on this uh, definition. Um, it's nothing. There's nothing wrong with that. Actually, it sounds quite positive because this person, this politician, is serving his people. Well, are you saying that's like a universal? Uh, uh, you think that's a universal? Um, I, I think so. Definition. However, y- yeah, maybe p- perhaps, but I think because it's been used in you know throughout kind of Western uh, history or, or the experience that we've seen, you could probably argue that it may perhaps isn't universal because of what we see today. I, I think more it, that in Islam, this is our view. Of what a politician is, okay. um, in Western society, it is in its purest sense. But actually, people know politicians are deceptive liars, and so actually, when you hear that word of politician, mm. you do generally think this, and that's because the framework within the West is benefit, right? So, if benefit is the framework, then every role that someone does is going to be seeking their own benefit. So, a politician in the West gets into politics in order to fill their pockets or to seek power or their own ego. Right, and that's why you find it to become quite dirty because they will lie and they will be deceptive in order to do this. Right? Okay, they might they may lie and be deceptive, yeah. but um, 
in, in reality though would you not say that especially the people are voting for them hmm. they're voting for them to look after uh, to govern their affairs uh, exactly and primarily it may be a job but the job of the politician the MP or whatever is isn't it is to actually manage to govern uh, yeah. the people they represent yeah, definitely yeah that and that is a universal view so that, that's, that, that's what I mean in that, in that yeah, respect definitely. quite universal yeah and I would I would tend to agree with that as well I would say that politics is about looking after the affairs of the people and you could even argue that a lot of the kind of non-muslim kind of western politicians that originally got into politics yeah. many of them you would say got into politics to help people you know yeah. a lot of them say that but what ends up happening is because the politics of the Western nations is so corrupt and elitist. It actually creates bad politicians out of people who might have been somewhat, you know, good in the the you know a different sense of the word. They might have wanted to mm. achieve good in the first place. So this is where the the de- definition I think you you described is fine. The definition is looking after the affairs of the people. How that then kind of facil- is facilitated later is where the problem arises yeah no i'd agree with that definitely and i think that's why when it comes to the question as whether the messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam was a politician based on that definition absolutely he was because he did look after the affairs of the ummah the community and his people and he he did want to serve his people so absolutely based on that definition the messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam is was a, a politician and we can give examples of where that was the case and how he did the certain things that would be akin to a politician Okay, so before you go into the examples, uh, maybe uh, uh, another thing to mention, which would be would be would be good, is that okay, we can talk about the messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam being a politician, but um, there's even the element where people, when when you talk about politics and Islam, hmm. people see this as something which is con- like a contradiction. Yeah. So if Islam has a political nature, an aspect, then certainly the messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam would be a politician yeah so you know we can see from islam that like you said if you're talking about mm-hmm. uh, politics is governing people's affairs yeah. then you'd have to say that islam gives solutions doesn't it yeah so this is where the problem i think has come from is like in recent decades and you know the last century or so the case of politics becoming a bit of a dirty word has been because of western politics has been because of the lack of proper islamic politics so what's happened is even our very mosques yeah. knowingly or unknowingly because they well knowingly of of the western politics they what don't want us to get involved in that because they see that as dirty and islam as pure and they don't want to mix the two so the logic you can understand if this there is this dirty version of politics now why would you let that come into a pure version of islam True, yeah. but then that's the problem is that the muslims and those mosques are not then highlighting what is the correct form of politics because like less than 100 years ago Islam existed in politics and then the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam in Medina formed the first Islamic state so and that was politics so it's just terminology now i think the word politics has been muddied and dirtied so much by the kind of yeah. the m- most recent western civilization that all of a sudden people don't want to mix that with the exactly. purity of islam it's kind of, it carries that kind of burden mm. of that negativity stigma yeah that stigma also would you not say that if people view islam as just a religion exactly then they would see that politics is not part of it exactly. yeah, yeah definitely and that that's why i think it is quite important to understand what is islam you know mm. what what how do we define islam and islam has both its spiritual aspects as as well as political mm-hmm. in the sense that we know where we came from we know we know we came from Allah. We know we're going back to Allah. So in that sense, it's spiritual, and mm-hmm. we undertake certain ritual actions in order to gain Jannah, right? However, Islam also has given us the rules and akam and how to um, you know how to implement certain rules in society. So we know that Islam also has that aspect as well, and, and we don't need to seek other uh, ways and systems in order to understand what we need to do in life itself. And this is a political aspect of Islam. Um, and, and, and that's why the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, as you were saying, undertook these actions and undertook the actions in Mecca for the first 13 years in order to obtain that state in, in Medina because he was a politician and he, he wanted a, a system that would protect the Muslims and allow Islam to spread uh, across the world. And this links also, I think, is worth mentioning, is that this is why other religions naturally don't fit the mould of what Islam is. Because other religions have those solutions yeah. for what, where man came from, you know, what happened before life, 
yeah. and where man will go after life, you know, if, if there's a day of judgment and all of those aspects. Mm. But yet they don't have rules and regulations for this life. Exactly. They ha- may have certain warnings and may- certain kind of things that help them do good and bad, like Christianity, but yeah. they never had uh, a full-blown kind of political system no. to be implemented, whereas Islam does. And this is why, as we know, the enemies of Islam do not want Islam to rise like that again, because it's totally different from the word that they use, religion. Islam is an ideology, it's a way of life. It's a deen, yeah. It's a deen. It actually brings together what is before life, what yeah. is after life, mm-hmm. but then, as equally importantly, what we do while we are here on this yeah. earth. And to be honest, it, it, we get in, in Islam, we have the specifics as well. We have the economic system, we have the social system, we have the penal code, the laws. There's, it's not even just... In Christianity, you have certain kind of principles. Or like morals. Yeah, right? morals. You might well. have some laws, yeah. but very few. Exactly. Oh. Whereas in Islam, it's very specific, yeah. and the, the entire system is from Islam. Uh, and that makes it different from any other religion or any other Yeah, way. but probably another way of looking at that also is the fact that with a lot of the religions, also is that... They, they obviously have uh, do's and don'ts and uh, a lot of times the punishments for the don'ts are in the hereafter, After, isn't But it? not yeah. here, yeah, exactly. And even like you can bring a full, well, you have a full constitution exactly. from Islam. So, whereas uh, some of these other religions, like you said there, the don'ts are more a kind of a bit of a don't do this in fear of the next life don't or do this in reward in the next life rather than going actually we'll give you rules and regulations and a full constitution to follow while in this life yeah. and if you do that you'll benefit society in this life but you will also benefit yourself in the next life yeah now cause i remember there was a time we would speak to a knowledgeable brother i think you might have even been there rash and uh, he for him he just couldn't you know um bear to use the word politics mm. and uh, it was odd because even if you just uh, you know, go to Google Translate and, and you see what politics, you know, is, is siyasa. Yeah. And even in, in the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala used the word siyasa when he refers to Bani Israel. Mm-hmm. And, and he's referring to the prophets who used to look after the affairs of the uh, of Bani Israel. Yeah, yeah. And, and for him, what he was saying is that rather than politics, he would rather use the word governance. And mm-hmm. I said, look, okay, look, if you want to use that word, <laughs> that's fair enough. But the point is, is that, you know, he, he wasn't, uh, disagreeing with the fact that Islam is a comprehensive mm. deen, you know, it doesn't, it, like you said, it, it just, it doesn't just deal with the matters to do with the, you know, the before life and after life. In fact, mm. it gives you a full system, a systems of life, exactly. uh, in regards to how to live your life here, and links them to before and after. Yeah, yeah. and that's why I think it's terminology. Some people prefer to use the word statesman. Mm-hmm. So when they talk about the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, they say he was a statesman. Yeah. But actually, a statement, statesman, what does he do? He's a politician. He's a yeah. politician. He, he carries out actions which help the affairs of the people. Yeah, so yeah. I think that's just, like you say, it's the stigma yeah. of politics, Western politics. And not just Western politics, a lot of the politics in Muslim lands yeah, now, yeah. especially like Asian subcontinent and places like that where there's this fallacy of democracy there. It's very, very corrupt. You know, yeah. places that we come from, Bangladesh, Pakistan type places, the politics there is extremely corrupt. Yeah. Why would you want to bring that into Islam? And I think yeah. that's where that stigma and has I, come from. And I think that's why I understand it. So I understand why people have this view because you they can only go by experience. Yeah. And our whole life... And for years, that's the only politics we've seen. Mm. So we haven't, you know, unless we've read books, we haven't actually seen uh, the, the real politics where it's genuinely about looking after the affairs of the people. And that's why, you know, so, certain examples we can use from the seerah, where the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, even in Mecca, so the fact that the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi was challenging certain customs that the Quraysh were doing, like burying the daughters alive, riba, the way they used to cheat in the marketplace. All of these things are what a politician would do to, oh. to kind of highlight the evils of these uh, these ways. And al- although he didn't bring something there and then and say, this, you should do this instead, he was questioning the fact that this way of life you're living and the, and the systems of life that you carry are, are uh, you know, are in- incorrect and just um, and there's a better way. And then when it came to Medina, he implemented that. And the fact that he was a leader in mm. Medina in itself is the biggest proof that he was a politician because he was yeah. a leader. Yeah, I think you know if you if you use the, if you give these example, examples to Muslims, uh, they will they won't disagree. I just think like right like Russia said as well that it's a stigma of the word mm. of of the word politics and politician. But what we can clearly see is from you know the examples that you've given. Is the messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam? You know, he he did perform po- political actions. Yeah. You know, uh, he signed treaties. 
Mm-hmm. You know, yeah. he sent uh, uh, messages to foreign kings and stuff. If you know, he ruled uh, law, he ruled laws. He you know, yeah. he fought in battles. If, if if none of these were seen as political, then you know what is politics? Exactly. And, and I think to be honest with you, is if we remove the stigma of the word politics, and like you said, whether we say politics is universal, but then also. Let's just to be safe, we say we have Islamic politics. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, and I think what Rash made a fantastic point, the fact that the problem is, is that, you know, that example hasn't been around for, yeah. you know, some people argue 100 years, some people argue, you know, probably a bit longer, longer yeah. because, you know, towards the end, even the Uthmani Khilafah, you know, um, it wasn't really, uh, whether I can say this or not, really wasn't really fit for purpose in a way. Mm. But nevertheless, you know, we have beautiful examples from the, the early companions and, you know, for at least a thousand years yeah, plus, yeah. Mm-hmm. you know, of uh, Islam, of uh, ruling politics. Yeah. You know, even if you have the rules to do with the, the Dhimnis, exactly. the non-Muslims that live in the Muslim lands, you know, even Islam governs their affairs. Yeah. So if you're, it's not even a case of just for Muslims, you know, they have certain rules that they have to abide by. Exactly. There are things that they, have, they can refer back to their own religions. But in regards to the societal matters, they have to conform with the rules of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yeah. So why do you think that this element or this side of the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam or this side of Islam, why it's hidden and why, yeah. you know, I think it's quite deliberate. Yeah, it's back to what Rash was saying, that the fact that uh, um, we live or we're dominated by the secular system. And the secular system, as we know, we don't need to really define it, we know that that means it's a godless society, a society where God and Allah and uh, your religion has no say. And it is, uh, as the saying goes, it's a detachment of the church from the state or, or religion from the state. And this is what secularism is. So uh, taking that as a principle of what the framework is that we live in and, and the dominant framework, then no doubt... How, you know the message that Islam is also about politics, and the message of Islam was a politician, is at odds with this. So they need to do away with that and make Islam into a mere set of rituals and religion only, because that is goes against secularism. If you were to say that Islam also is, has its politics, and the message of Islam was a politician, and there is this example out there that is against secularism, mm. that goes at odds with that, and that's why there's a, um, there's a deliberate attempt to take that part of Islam and, and you know, shun it away. And, and, so, and so that's the part that they threat, they, they feel threatened, threatened by, by, because, you know, uh, the other the other element, the other side of it doesn't really threaten the interest, does it? Exactly, it doesn't, because it's in the homes, it's in yeah. the mosques. And you can use a simple example. That's why they're not threatened by other religions. That's why there isn't an attack on Christianity. Good point. There exactly. isn't an tra- attack on Judaism and yeah. those things, because those other religions don't have... A yeah. political aspect they're not a political creed no. Islam is a political and a spiritual creed that mean that is fearful for them or that's yeah. they fear that and that comes down to the fact that there's an agenda there's an agenda behind all of this and whether and this is not to say that the mosques are pushing that agenda purposefully or intentionally but they have fallen into the trap of when this agenda was pushed by the the Western governments from the beginning, after the collapse of the Islamic State, after the collapse of the Khilafah, after the splitting up of our lands, there was an agenda to make sure that Islam does not arise again yeah. in that political sphere. And in order to do that, they, what they had to do is now there was no state apparatus. How do they stop? You know, they've destroyed the state apparatus. Mm. What do you do now? You then break down in the minds of people that, oh, Islam is just a religion. There is no political aspect. Get used to that. Then you fit in our society. Exactly. As soon as you want more than that, you don't fit in our society, which is where we're now starting to see the clash again as people are kind of waking up to it more and more. Yeah, It's, yeah. it's very important as well because... I know we'll go into the topic a bit more in detail about the kind of general elections and the democratic elections, but this point, this the, the, the fact that many Muslims may not appreciate the fact that we have our politics and we have, our, um, you know, that it's, it's at odds with uh, secularism, allows Muslims to think, oh, we can get involved in this mm. other politics because Islam doesn't really have this. Islam is just for my home or my rich elections. But if one was to understand that, no, actually, Islam does have its politics and there is a, a certain system out there that will you know, give justice to the entire u- the world, then actually you would never even think about going to democratic elections because your focus will be on the Islamic side of politics. Yeah, subhanAllah. I mean, uh, Islam, what, what Rash said as well, you know, um, in regards to the, the, the people, they don't really... 
appreciate Islam politics because we haven't actually appre- we haven't seen it, right? Yeah. But if you think about it, you know, uh, like Rash said, why is it a war against Islam and a war on not a war on Judaism, yeah. not a war on Sikhism and all that? You know, why is it even if you think about locally in Britain, or you actually this is a, this is a Western uh, issue where you know you hear the question of are you British or Muslim? Yeah. yeah, but you never hear the question: Are you British or Sikh? Because no. the thing is, is that you know, to be British from their point of view, it, it means to adopt their way of life. It means to adopt the fact that man is a legislator, to accept their values, their freedoms, etc. Right? That's what it means to be British, right? Yeah. So the Sikhs do this, the the Hindus will do this, and whoever else will do it. But as Muslims, even though we don't have the apparatus like Russia is on about, or we probably haven't, you know, witnessed. Uh, the the state itself or it's political Islam, but the reality is is the fact that even then they find it so difficult because if we just go to the books of the Hadith or the Quran, mm. it's quite clear that as Muslims we have our own. In the past, I would have said way of uh, Islam is a way of life, but actually a better way is to say is that Islam is systems of life, yeah. and we have our own systems. You understand? And hence why that discussion that topic is there is purely because. Islam and that way of life is at odds, mm. you know. So, okay, uh, you mentioned the uh, about the elections and stuff. So, you know, I think yeah. the first question really was about whether the messenger, sallallahu alaihi wasallam, was a politician, whether Islam has anything to do with politics, and uh, you know, I hope that we've uh, made that clear, and uh, you know, we're always open to uh, um, any other ideas or, or whether people think mm. otherwise. You know, so uh, so, but but we can see clearly from Islam that that is the case. Okay, now the issue I want to speak about, or let's say have a more of a discussion with you guys, mm. is about the uh, democratic elections. As Muslims participating in democratic elections, now uh, myself, I'm uh, you know slightly older than uh, you guys, <laughs> um, and and I remember a time when you know uh, when the Dao was very new on the scene. Okay, and what you used to see is uh, where even in the masjids, you know, no one spoke about politics. Mm. Uh, in those days, actually, uh, the counter to the dawah was that Islam was not to do with politics, right? The mosques would, you know, would allow you to speak about these type of things, the worldly matters in the masjid, mm. right? From there till now, brothers, I've seen a huge shift to mm. the extent where, uh, forget some people saying that this is now permissible. You have some people saying it's recommended mm. and some people are saying it's wajib, it's obligatory for Muslims mm. to be participating in the democratic elections. Now, what I think is a good idea, and I, I think that what may um, separate us or, or differentiate us from all the podcasts that I've listened to lately on these matters is that, you know, um, a lot of podcasts, they give their view and just their view. Uh, what I want to do and uh, what we want to do is really go through the different angles that Muslims come out with mm. um, and we will look at them from an Islamic lens and yep. see whether this is something which we can take or not. The reality is, is that, you know, we see from Islam that the Messenger wasallam said that when people, you know, make an ishtihad or when people refer back to Islam, you know, for the one who gets it right, especially in those matters that are not clear, the one who gets it right, you know, gets two rewards and the one who gets it wrong, um, gets one reward. Mm. So the issue here isn't character character uh, assassinating any scholar or anyone. These are people who have studied for for many many years and dedicated their lives to Islam. But nevertheless, the discussion on the strongest opinion has to be met. And in all fairness, I will say this: that from my point of view, you know, it's it, this is not even a matter which is open to interpretation personally mm. because the evidences which we'll go through. Or that clear Okay So what I want to do is Let's go through some of the arguments mm. But uh, I think I personally uh, Break up the arguments in, in um, And separate them in two boxes Right okay. The first box is Those those angles that people come across uh, Which are linked to some sort of Like Islamic flavour mm-hmm. And then I think Then you got the other side The other box Where it's purely People who um, maybe it's, it's more about necessity and the need and minorities and etc etc. Yep. They are sort of linked, okay. Um, and you even get some people who promote the Islamic angle, but then also quote the other angles to do with need and all that, which is very odd because if there's an Islamic angle, then you don't need to go into right. whether it's a lesser of evils or whatever, right? Yeah. Okay. So let's go through some of these arguments, right? So the first one that I want to talk about is the issue which I'll I'll sort of introduce. Yeah. 
Yeah. And then you guys, we can have a discussion. Is the issue of uh, uh, the Muslims who migrated to Abyssinia, Habasha, and the issue of uh, Najashi. Okay, so, you know, uh, quick update uh, or recap uh, for people who probably don't know the story. We see, we know that uh, during the, the Meccan years, the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam allowed uh, some of the Muslims to migrate to Habasha to um, escape the torture and the persecution that they were receiving at the hands of the Quraysh. And uh, the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam had said that the king of... Uh, of uh, Habasha, Najashi, mm. it was a just man, he was a fair man, and that he would, uh, you know, they would find justice there. So we know that uh, they went there, and uh, the Quraysh sent some emissaries after them, mm. and after lengthy discussions, which if you want to, we can discuss afterwards, but uh, the, the king ruled on the fact that the Muslims were allowed to stay in Habasha, mm. um, and in fact, he said that, you know, th- there was a lot of similarities between Islam mm. and uh, Christianity. Christianity. He was Christian, by the way. Okay. So now, where does the discussion, where does this argument come from? Now, what people's claim is that Najashi later on became Muslim, and the argument is that uh, what we are saying is that did the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam did he allow Najashi to rule by kufr um, and? The people who promote this view, they say that he did, which would mean that as Muslims living in a non-Islamic society, mm. this is fine. We can do this because Najashi ruled by Kufr. Mm. Um, so inshallah, ta'ala, that's the background. Mm. Okay, so let's discuss the, the uh, let's look at the evidences then to yeah. see, you know, what is the, the, the main details to take from this. So I think, um, like you said, um, this is this is an Islamic so it's based on Islam. So the Islamic evidence is, is, is the story is true in terms of that the Muslims did migrate there and lived under uh, this Christian king who's known to be a just king. Um, but the, the first issue I have with the argument that, uh, so the argument, as you said, is that Najashi was ruling by Kufr. And why didn't the Messenger وسلم, reprimand Najashi, right? Because, you know, if, if he knew that he was ruling by Kufr and he's a Muslim, because I think the argument is that Najashi became Muslim. Yeah. So how would the Muslim allow a Muslim ruler to rule by kufr? Um, so the first thing uh, I think we need to ask is, when did Najashi actually become Muslim? This is this is the point that we we're not sure of actually. We we don't know when he became Muslim, and there's argument to say that. Um, he didn't become Muslim straight away. He was still a Christian. Yes, he had some sympathy for the Muslims, and he he, under, he, he was just right. But he didn't become Muslim straight away. In fact, uh, the evidence suggests that um, the Messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam only knew that Najashi became was a Muslim or became Muslim at some point when Najashi passed away. So, just to give you some uh, the, the the hadith that is mentioned, uh, the Messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam said. Uh, when when the Najashi died, today a pious man has died, so stand to pray for your brother uh, Ashima. And I won't go into like all the kind of fiki, uh, just to kind of paraphrase of what, um, what what we're trying to say here. The fact that the Messenger Sallam used certain language suggests that he didn't know that the Mas- uh, that Najashi was a Muslim, and um, you know the fact that he used he was a pious man, um, and that he used the the word brother. He didn't. He didn't say that this a Muslim has passed away, and we need to perform janaza. Only afterwards he performed the janaza of I forgot what the word is, but basically the, in absence, in absence, in absence. Janaza, janaza in absence. So if the Messenger of Islam didn't know Najashi was a Muslim during when his, when he was alive, how would he reprimand him? How could he? Because he didn't know that he was a, a Muslim. Yeah, yeah. And my other argument. This isn't. I haven't read this, or this is not used. But when I've just kind of studied this topic, is if Najashi was a Muslim ruler and king, why wouldn't the Messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam and the Messenger knew that? Why wouldn't he have gone to Najashi and wanted to establish Islam within Abyssinia? Because he'd know that this is a land where we have a Muslim king, mm-hmm. so we could use this to our advantage. And the, f- the fact is, the Messenger didn't do this. So I think that's one point of contention with this argument that oh, why did why did the Messenger allow a Muslim to rule by kufr? Okay, like I mean, even like like you said there, I think one of the key questions I would say is uh, because 
I personally feel that the you know the issue here isn't clear. No. Um, so what we can see is that you mentioned about the hadiths, that it's clear that the mess that the Najashi, or a Najashi, right, yeah. uh, became Muslim. Uh, but what we see is that the people who claim that because uh, there is a view that the, he became a, a, a Muslim a while back, yeah, and the evidences that are used. Or that there are two letters, um, you know, which were sent to the messenger for, by uh, Najashi yeah. to say that he had become Muslim. But, you know, uh, these letters, even the people who uh, use this view, even they will, uh, you know, accept that these letters were not hadiths. Mm. These were just uh, what they would say tradition. Exactly. Okay, and there's even a saying of um, that's a brother posted to me of uh, Amr ibn al uh, radi al anhu when uh, when he was having a dialogue with uh, Heraclius, mm-hmm. and I think at this stage I don't think he was even Muslim, but nevertheless yeah. that he mentioned something about the conversion of Najashi. Najashi yeah. But from that, what we can see is that you know, we, you know, we can't be sure of when he became mm-hmm. when he became Muslim. Yeah, exactly. You know? So, like you said, how would he have? How would there be reprimand? And to be honest with you, there's uh, stuff that I've been, I mean, no, probably not going to go into it too much, but if people want more information that we can we can provide, it's not a problem, is that, you know, some people claim that it's not clear whether the Najashi that the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam prayed Janazah for was the same Najashi mm. that had uh, yeah. uh, take look at, looked after the uh, Muhajireen, yeah. you know. Yeah. Uh, and also, uh, another point, just to add to yours, is the fact that... Uh, this is something which you would have expected as even in even in the books of Bukhari mm. um, they mention that there's a section about the death of Najashi mm-hmm. but there's nothing to do with his conversion exactly. okay mm-hmm. and the fact that the language that you mentioned the the, the Prophet used that your brother mm. you know, has passed away this this would mean that you know you could take from this that the the Sahaba they would not have known this that he was Muslim because you know if you look at the the message of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa and he would have uh, said let's make funeral for one of the companions or something mm-hmm. he would not have said he was a pious man no. he would not have said that he's your brother mm-hmm. because this is something which is which is given um, yeah. anything you want to add to this uh, Rash? No, I, I, personally I would just I don't I think this topic it doesn't require as much of the discussion really because I think it's a bit of a there's speculation involved and I think we still need to take a step back and go, why do people even use this example? Is because they're trying to find an excuse to do something which we're going to, I'm sure, talk about that is mm-hmm. not halal. Yeah, mm-hmm. To vote to legislate someone in place of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is a haram, it's, it's yeah. shirk. Yeah? Yeah. And we'll talk about that, I'm sure. But, you know, all of these side things, even the issue of Najashi is something that gives you an excuse to do something which is haram yeah. but giving you the permission to do it mm-hmm. yeah and there's a few of these isn't there and i'm sure you're going to mention some yeah. more of them so i think this one in particular because like you say there's elements of speculation there's elements of not knowing the exact things a lot of speculation a lot of speculation yeah. and on top of that because we don't know the exact time frames we don't know how much of the islamic ruling system was actually revealed at this time yeah. yeah. So then you can't even start to go. Oh, wait there. How much of it was revealed? Which bits did he know about? Which mm-hmm. isn't he? So oh, all it, again, it becomes yeah. very speculative. Yes. Yeah, um, and even to the extent that you know, in that story, um, Jafar ibn Abi Talib, he did. He even chose not to bow to the Najashi when he got there, even though that was a tradition in that the law, the law in that yeah. place. So again, there's the reasons why the Muslims didn't carry out actions that you know were un-Islamic even though they were the traditions of the time. So for someone to now say, you need to vote now, because maybe, you know, because those Muslims there, you know, lived under a just king, Mm. it doesn't work, because they didn't go and fight in the armies. There was a battle. They didn't go and fight under Najashi's army. They didn't bow to Najashi. Okay, they lived there, but he allowed them to live there. And I think that's enough, really, for me personally. And I think, you know, as Muslims... Obviously, mom, the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is Allah. innocent and masoom and can never make a mistake. And to make a claim that the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam allowed mm. someone to rule, rule by, by kufr, kufr yes. 
it's is a big massive. Claim. It's a massive claim yeah. to make. So, you know, we our benefit of not even doubt, but our side is with the Messenger of Salam. Exactly. So even the speculation, we don't err towards that side because we know the Messenger of Salam was the best and perfect of all of us. Yeah. Mm. And how could we ever make such a massive claim of the Messenger? Yeah. So we would always give the benefit of the doubt because of speculation anyway. Yeah. And this is why I refer to the exclusion bit is because I would say to someone, bring me something else. Exactly. Because you're asking me to vote now. Yeah, and so because this is the yeah. topic, isn't it? You're asking me to go and vote, which I know is not allowed, and you know is not allowed, because the the, the ulama have already agreed. Yeah, they they agree, agree that this is not allowed, but they're trying to find me a reason or an ex- exclusion mm-hmm. for, as to why I can do it. I would say, bring me something else, because there's not enough clarity in bringing this to actually make me do what I see as a sinful action. Okay, they, they, well, a lot of people do bring something, other things, which yeah. we, we're, <laughs> we're going to go through. But just you know, on that, uh, just at this point, Rash, I want to make some important, important comments. Right, first one is the fact that I think I personally took it for granted that as Muslims we all uh, we all uh, accept that democracy is kufr and this and that. True. And probably because we only did a, a podcast last previously, one. the last one. So so what I would say is we haven't gone into too much details for this. Purely because just listen to the last podcast, isn't yeah, it? Yeah? Yeah, yeah, but I don't think we should take it for granted, though. You're yeah. right, listen to the last podcast, yeah. definitely. We did cover it, but I think very, very briefly, mm-hmm. it is worth highlighting that, and I just mentioned in my last comment, in that it's worth highlighting that when the ulama are telling people to vote, or where, they, or not, not, or where there's people of influence, people of knowledge, imams, mm-hmm. people are telling people to vote, they themselves know that it's haram. Yeah. But are they telling the people that, by the way, guys, this is haram, but I'm giving you an excuse why you can do it? Exactly. Yeah? Because as we're going to discuss, there are excu- reasons why you can sometimes carry out haram actions. Mm. But has that person of knowledge, have that person of influence gone to the effort of going to someone, you know what, this is haram. And this is haram because you're not, allow, you're not allowed to let someone, yeah. man, Legislate in place of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala But, but, but that's what I mentioned at the, at the beginning mm. That before it used to be a case where this is not allowed mm. But but what I'm seeing late, late, what I'm seeing more recently yeah. Is that, and your point you're making mm. Is that now you've got some people that are saying participate. participate They're not even saying that it's not allowed But you participate mm. because of X, Y and Z yeah. Some are just saying that you should participate yeah, Exactly, yeah, you know? they're not given the background yeah. So you know, in regards to the Najashi uh, uh, the, the Najashi issue mm. You're right, maybe you know it doesn't need to be uh, too much doesn't need, We don't need to spend too much time on it But what I would say is that there are a few things that I want to Throw out us questions, yeah. okay, for, for us to think about, for the, the, the listeners to think about. And those are that I personally think that you have the story of Najashi ruling, mm-hmm. but I think Rush made a fantastic point that for for us, maybe our situation is probably more likened to the Muhajireen who went there, yeah, yeah. who were partaking in the system as citizens. Yeah. Okay. And if you look at the example of the Muhajireen uh, when they went there. They never bowed in front of uh, the the Najashi, even though this could have this could have they could have been kicked out and sent back. It was an insult. Okay? It was an insult. It was a massive insult. Yeah. You know, they didn't participate in the system. Some people argue that they made a dua and somehow they extend that to participate. That's 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 too far fetched. Um, yeah. They didn't participate, and you know another thing is the similarities between them and now. And mm-hmm. what I mean by that is, look at the Mahajirin. In reality, they were political asylum seekers, yeah. right? Yeah. They had gone there to avoid uh, being persecuted in their lands. Muslims now living in the West, we're living with the mindset that this is our home and it's going to be our home forever. Yeah. We ain't even thinking about that, yeah, we should be living under Islam and we need to be back there. And We are actually thinking forward about we're going to be here forever and how can we make this a place better for us? So that's the difference there. Yeah. Also, if we think about it, you know, the... Uh, the Najashi, he was a just ruler. Yeah. Can we say that the the example is the same where you have the the kingdom of the Christian kingdom of Najashi, and you have in the West those nations that are openly waging war on Islam and waging war on the Muslims, right? Yeah. How can you liken them living under them? Yeah. This, uh, how can you make this comparison? Yeah. I find that I find that very odd. And that's enough for me. If someone yeah. said that, I don't need to know about any of the <laughs> other things. You know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. Okay, let's yeah. move on, inshallah, because like you said, 
you want people to bring other things and people do bring other things they do, yeah, they so do. let's move on to the next example okay. which which I don't think takes too long because you know but and nevertheless we're going to uh, give the the view and then we'll discuss what we think about it and that's the example of Yusuf alayhi salam and the fact that he held a, a governmental position as a minister uh, from what is claimed and that he was implementing kufr okay so uh, so what do, what, do you, what do you guys think so let's just give a bit of background on what happened uh, because I think this this claim itself needs to be questioned. That was the firstly, can we can we say any prophet implemented kufr? Subhanallah, this is blasphemous in its sense in itself. We cannot say this. They're, they're masum. All the prophets are masum, and uh, we cannot make such a massive claim. So especially since the, uh, in the Quran it says that Yusuf Ali, Yusuf Ali Islam said. Um, in them, in the Mormon, Mormon, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, 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 that there, there's no legislation yes, except yes. with Allah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yes. That's right. So um, no, and this, and this is the point. So what did happen? Uh, just to paraphrase of what actually happened, um, there was a king in, in Egypt, and Yusuf alayhi salam. What he was saying to the king is that allow me to have like a resource management position uh, to look after the stock of agriculture, right? And that's all he wanted to do. It wasn't about legislation. So well, he didn't want to become a legislator. Mm-hmm. All he wanted is that, let me have that uh, the position in order to, you know, und- um, you know, give out stock. Because this is linked to his dream as well. Yeah, linked to his dream, that dream that occurred, right? So that's what the position was. To now say that that was a legislative position where he was enacting man-made laws is massive claim to make and incorrect. Mm-hmm. So, so, okay, fair enough, that's the premise that's used. But what I'm trying to say is it's an incorrect premise to use. But let's just take it for now, right? So that's the first point, that it's not... That claim itself is incorrect. He was a resource manager, and he was kind of re- deciding how to how to um, split the split the, the stock, sorry. Um, so that's the first thing. And the, the point you mentioned is is, is another, another massive point, that it's ironic that in Surah Yusuf itself, that ayah we know, that everyone knows, that in al-hukmu illa lillah, that there is no... Uh, right to legislate except with Allah right he, he himself said this mm-hmm. so how can you now claim that he would say this and then take on the position of legislation you can't how would he and implement kufr and implement kufr subhanallah <laughs> it's, 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 so this argument again I feel like it is clutching at straws and if we were sincere to ourselves we would realise that no this is not the case and we shouldn't be using such uh, claims and then the, the main point I think from because this, this is the context of it, I think the main point is that when it comes to previous prophets, uh, when it comes to all the previous prophets, we, as Muslims, should not use their Sharia and their Akam as as ours. That is not our Sharia to use because we have the Sharia of Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and the Deen of Allah subhanahu wa taala is perfect. Uh, that we know that it's perfected, so we don't need to go to the previous Sharia, and we are not allowed to go to the previous Sharia uh, and use these for certain rules. And an example comes to mind is when. Uh, in the time of Yusuf salam, the people were allowed to bow to man, right? And um, this obviously isn't allowed today. So we can't cannot take certain rules from previous prophets and say that it's allowed to do today. The same applies to Isa alayhi salam. Drinking alcohol and wine was okay then. Are we now saying that it's okay to do for us? No, because we have the Sharia of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam. Yeah, yeah, of course, and and uh, I mean the example you gave about the prostration, just to give yeah. uh, more detail on that is, when uh, Yusuf al-Islam's parents and his brother came to see him, they prostrated, yeah. mm. and um, and this was out of uh, it wasn't worship, respect. but it was out of respect, right? Yeah. But this and that links to his dream as well, isn't it? Because his original dream had him seeing something that you know was it twelve stars, and that was in. The no, prostration didn't, you know, his dream that he had where there was a number of stars right at the beginning of the story of Yusuf okay. alayhi salam is about yeah. the stars in the sky and it links all the way through to the end of his story where the stars almost represent his family bowing to him. Subhanallah. But what, what we can see is that, as JK said, this was permissible according to the law of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala at that time, right? Yeah. But we know that, you know, in regards to the, the, the sharia of the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wasallam. We know that this is not allowed, yeah, okay? Exactly. Because uh, we know there's a hadith of the Messenger, uh, sallallahu alaihi wasallam, where he said that if I were to have commanded anyone to prostrate to anyone else, I would have commanded women to prostrate to their husbands, mm, yeah. okay? So this is here is it's an evidence that in Islam, yeah. you can't prostrate, you know, to anyone. No. If anyone, if it was allowed, it would have been to husbands. 
but it's not because you can only prostrate to, to Allah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yeah. And, uh, and you know, there was, uh, there was also uh, in regards to the previous prophets, uh, the, the yeah. Sharia, the previous prophets, you know, we just want to give some, put some uh, meat on the bone, uh, as they would say. So what we can see is that, you know, in, the, in mm-hmm. Surah Al-Maida, yeah. uh, Ayat 48, we see that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, the transition, the meaning, for every one of you, we mm-hmm. have ordained a divine law and a methodology. Okay, yeah. and also there's another. Um, so the ayat says, and we have sent down to you the book, i.e., the Quran in yeah. truth, confirming the scripture that came before it, and muhaymanan, muhaymanan mm. over it. Okay, yeah. the old scriptures, and there was a, a, a tafsir and trans- extra uh, information in regards to uh, the word muhaymanan. Okay, yeah. over it, right? And um, so what it means is entrusted over it. So according to Sufyan authority, uh, he narrated from Abu Ishaq, from At-Tamimi, from Ibn Abbas. Uh, Ali ibn uh, Abi Talha reported that Ibn Abbas said, Muhaymin is the trustworthy. Allah says that the Quran is trustworthy over every divine book that preceded it. Yep. Okay. Um, others said that the Quran is trustworthy over the books that preceded it. Therefore, whatever in these books uh, confirms conforms to the Quran is true. Yeah. Whatever disagrees with the Quran is false. And also, um, Ibn Abbas said that Muhaminan means it's dominant over the previous scriptures, yeah. i.e., mm-hmm. the fact that now it has abrogated everything the previous everything from the previous scriptures. Um, yeah. And and so even though there may be something which is conforms to the previous scriptures. You follow it not because of the previous scriptures. You follow it because this is the Sharia of Muhammad exactly. sallallahu alaihi wasallam. And just to reiterate that point, um, just come to mind that story in which uh, Omar uh, was seen with the scriptures of uh, the uh, Mus- uh, the scriptures of the Torah, and he was reading these. And Muhammad sallam saw him reading these when when it wasn't allowed to really read. Muhammad sallam said not to really read the the previous scriptures, and he became very angry with Omar. He said that. Haven't I bought you something mm. better than this? Because even if Musa salam was here today, he would have no choice but to follow my Sharia, to follow the Quran. So that in itself, even the prophets, if they came, obviously it's hypothetical. But if they were to be here in the time of Musa, they would have no choice but to follow the Quran and Sunnah. But even uh, the, as as I've heard a, a very long time ago, even they say that the coming of Isa alayhi salam, Isa when he comes yeah. back, he's going to come back in a capacity as the Ummati. Okay. Of the Messenger Muhammad so sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Exactly. But just to uh, end this part, there's uh, you know in the in the same uh, group of ayat in verse forty eight Surah Maida, mm. Allah subhanahu wa taala says um, to each among you we have prescribed a law and a clear way. If Allah willed, He would have made you one nation, nation. Yeah. Yeah. but that He may test you in what He has given you, so compete in good deeds. Now the Tafsir of Ibn Khathir about the ayat, if Allah willed, he would have made you one nation. SubhanAllah, what he says, he says that this is a general proclamation to all nations, informing them of Allah's mighty ability. Hmm. If Allah wills, he would have He would make all mankind follow one religion and one, one law that would never be abrogated. Allah decided that every prophet would have his own distinct law and that it and that is later abrogated partially or totally with the law of a latter prophet. Later on, all previous laws are abrogated by the law that Allah sent with Muhammad uh, وسلم, who was the final prophet to be sent, the seal of the prophets. So, you know, this is from Ibn Khatir about that uh, the ayat mm-hmm. and what it meant. So, you know, the issue of uh, the example of yes, uh, Yusuf al-Islam, I would say that, uh, you know, there's a lot of speculation. There's even speculation whether the whether the king became Muslim. Yeah, true. But we don't need to use this, okay? Because the issue here is about following the previous Sharia, the previous prophets. Uh, I would say, though, that a brother did uh, share with me an opinion of uh, Imam Al-Qurtubi. And what he said was, uh, some of the people on knowledge said, this ayat is an evidence that it is allowed for a righteous man to work for a disobedient man and a kafir sultan with the condition that he will allow him to do whatever he wants and won't prevent him from doing what he wants. Mm. Then he can establish justice, but if the kafir forced him to follow his kufr and desires, then it isn't allowed. Another people of knowledge said that this was only made permissible for Yusuf al-Islam and doesn't apply to us today. 
But according to Imam Al-Qurtubi, he said that the first opinion is more strong, uh, correct, if it is according to the condition I mentioned above. So what I would say is, you know, we need to show both sides. Yeah. So here you have Imam Al-Qurtubi saying that, you know, in this situation, uh, we can use this as an evidence, even though it does go against the, you know, the clear quote I asked. Nevertheless, that, you know, the, as an amazing uh, scholar and a great scholar, but even if you think about what he's saying, he's even given a condition exactly. that he cannot follow kufr, he has to only follow what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has commanded. So how can he be involved in legislation? Exactly. And that's the point that in the in the quote where he says that if the kafir forced him to follow his kufr desires, then it isn't allowed. So yes, you can work under him. But actually, when it comes to implementing kufr, no, absolutely, that's a red line. You cannot do that. So even in that, even though, like you said, it is an opinion, even in that opinion, it shows that we can't, that's not a justification to working in and voting in democratic elections, not at all. Yeah, so, you know, I think, subhanAllah, that, I think that that's clear. So, yeah. uh, if we can move on now, the, the next one really is a, a very quick one. We did uh, cover it uh, quite extensively in our last podcast, mm. and that's the issue of uh, Maqasid al-Sharia. Um, you know, I think this is, I think, uh, Rash, if you can remember, I think you really uh, uh, s- smashed it in the, subhanAllah, okay, <laughs> let's, let's, all right. You really made it clear <laughs> in, the, in the last podcast. <laughs> Um, what this is and, and why it cannot be used to uh, further kufr, yeah. whether you want to... No, yeah, yeah, just to quickly cl- clarify then, yeah, so because this falls into another one of those exceptions. Yeah, so what people say is the argument that is presented is the maqasid al-sharia, the maqasid al-sharia is... The objectives. Are the objectives of sharia. In other words... When Sharia is Im- implemented, you get these things, you get, you know, protection of life, you get protection of p- property, you get protection of the mind, in other words, sanity, you get protection of religion and lineage. So implementation of the Sharia leads to these. And when Imam al shatabi he wrote about this, he clarified it for people to say, look, this is what the Sharia should give you when you implement it. What happened subsequently is people started to use this back to front. Yeah. They started to say, well, actually, any system which achieves some degree of you know, protecting religion, some degree of protecting life, then all, or giving justice, all of a sudden mm-hmm. um, conforms to the objectives of Sharia. In other words, you can accept it. Mm-hmm. But this is completely flawed because we recognise that, you know, I'll give you some examples, and I think I mentioned them briefly last time, is... One of the things in this society that gives like freedom of religion and freedom of speech is the freedoms themselves. Yeah? But actually, we know the freedoms in this society contradict Islam mm-hmm. because the freedoms in this society are the same freedoms that allow you to insult the Prophet mm-hmm. They are the same freedoms that allow you to apostatize. Mm-hmm. Yeah? So this argument that you can use the maqasid as a mechanism to say, well, okay, these societies are... You know, on the from the outside of giving a level of justice, allow people to practice their religion, and therefore, you know, you can vote for them, which is where we're heading, is is flawed because actually, these very objectives only come from implementing the Sharia. Mm-hmm. And Imam Shatibi himself said these are outputs or these are things that are a consequence. Mm. of the Sharia being implemented rather than you use them in the beginning. Yeah. And I think the brother that was with us, you know, Aftab was with us last time, yeah. he mentioned a few really good points. And then I also mentioned after that that the idea was the reason why this became a bit more prominent is and it wasn't so known early days is because as reality changed, the need for ijtihad was mm. more. So when the, the imam or, you know, the mujtahid does ijtihad, in other words, deriving rules for a new reality from the Quran and the Sunnah and the, yeah. you know, the sources of legislation, from the sources of Sharia, that when the imam needs to do that, maybe he, well, not maybe, he also considers the, the objectives or the maqasid of Sharia. Yeah. So at least he's aware that he's deriving new rules, new reality, yeah. and then he can go, okay, I'm deriving them, but make sure I'm aware that I have to protect property, I have to protect life, I have to protect religion. So there was a context mm-hmm. around why Ashatabi was actually yeah. bringing this forward. And all of a sudden, nowadays, they go, okay, let's use that. Yeah, quite yeah. conveniently as a means of saying these western societies are implementing objectives of Sharia. Mm. very dangerous mm. yeah well to be honest with you the way you've just uh, explained it there you know i think it's, it's, it is very dangerous but we can clearly see the fact that 
people are using it the all wrong way around. Mm. The fact that uh, implementing Islam gives you justice, gives you this, gives mm. you that. This is because it's a divine system. Mm, it's yeah. from the Creator. It, because only the true system, which is from the Creator, can give justice. Because if man was to decide, then there's always going to be limitations exactly. in the judgment, and it can't be universal, right? Yeah, yeah. I'll give you a very, very easy, easy way to understand this for our listeners, especially. The sources of Sharia are Quran, Sunnah, Ijma Sahaba, Qiyas. Mm. Yeah, those mm. are the agreed upon sources of Sunnah so, um, Sh- of Sharia. Yeah, what this argument? Anybody who brings Makasid of Sharia is turned that on its head. They've made the Makasid of Sharia the sources. Yeah. And then they try to derive rules. And you know, if you do that, and if you let man do that, oh, all of a sudden you will get systems yeah. that just conform to man's benefit mm-hmm. and are not the Sharia at all. Yeah. And, and the, the main, I mean, you've put it simply, to be honest, and it's very clear the way you've just said it. And uh, I mean, I can't really add much more to that. But I think the concept that many of us are aware of, even, even just generally, is that the fact that the ends don't justify the means. So if the means is kufr, so... This argument, when it's used, what they're saying is that uh, we can take part in kufr and we can take part in a system that is known to be kufr and everyone agrees on that and then it will generate certain outcomes that you can kind of conflate with certain uh, objectives of sharia, mankasas of sharia, so then it's allowed. No, in Islam, there's no such principle. You can't undertake kufr or take the, the method of kufr in order to achieve good. Like, you don't want to rob a bank to give zakah. You wouldn't, you know, you wouldn't do wrong yeah. to achieve good. Exactly. To achieve good, you have the the action itself has to be permissible, and in this case, it's not permissible. Yeah. Subhanallah. Okay, inshallah. Uh, let's let's move on now. Mm. I think I think maybe we have left the box, the first box, which I was saying where normally you see that the the evidences are presented where with some sort of shari justification or some examples where someone did it or allowed it, right? Mm-hmm. Um, now to things where it's more to do with. Uh, necessity and it's more to do with things like this okay so the first one I think which would be worth discussing is the issue of the maslaha yeah masla musla right yeah. um, which is to do with the the benefit and the harm yeah. so what do you guys think on that is do that, you want to explain it first of all yeah. the angle and what angle the angle comes from yeah I mean it's very similar to um, the Makassar al-Sharia actually okay. it's very similar but uh, just to define what it is masla musla is about the achieving the public interest or the public benefit of a certain action or certain, uh, you know, uh, uh, by implementing something. Um, but again, it goes back to the point that when this principle is used when you implement Islam, when you implement, and I don't, I don't, I don't mean like the system of Islam per se, even, it can even be certain rules in Islam that we implement here, that we have no Islam. But when it comes to, for example, fasting, there's a certain public interest that can happen uh, due to fasting, for example. So uh, in this case, the fact that the Muslims at large gain patience through fasting. They don't know, uh, in terms of before doing it, if, if, if someone was to uh, never know about Ramadan, then you won't naturally re- recognise what the benefit is, but actually there are benefits from fasting in terms of, uh, like I said, patience, the fact that mm. the Muslims are united during the month. We find that yeah. most, many Muslims yeah. come together yeah. due to, to fasting. And, and the fact that... Uh, we also gain taqwa, as we know in the Quran that one of the key reasons or hikmah that Allah gives behind fasting is to attain taqwa. So this uh, Masra al-Mursala, the argument that is used is that by uh, getting involved in the political system or the democratic elections, that you will, as an outcome, achieve certain public benefits. So that would be around, for example, the, the Muslims would have more rights. Uh, there won't be like a far right nationalism taking place. So what they say, those who use it as an argument, is that you've, uh, you know, someone's come into play, uh, um, into power that won't have much more harm to the Muslims. And th- why this is wrong is that, again, back to your point, is that you can only apply this principle when you've applied Islam, not kufr, right? So it's only through Islamic action and Sharia. Only after that you see the the benefit. And that's why uh, we cannot, you know, bring, you know, you know, we cannot apply this to voting in a, a system of shirk and kufr, and then say, oh, this is maslaha, mm-hmm. this is this is a this is a benefit, a public benefit, because it doesn't apply. So uh, I think the thing with maslaha also is the fact that, it, you know, um, we see that the issue of the benefit yeah. in itself there's nothing wrong in that. No, okay, no. and we see that uh, there are certain maslahas which um, are accepted and some which are negated. Now, the first one, an example, which is 
maslaha, which is cancelled by the text. Yeah. Basically, it means uh, an interest, a maslaha, which is cancelled due to a ruling from the text. So all the ulama will accept that this is something which is Maslaha. not allowed. Now, an example that I came across, which is, I think is, it's a good example because it's quite simple, is the fact that uh, uh, one of the Khalifas, he had, um, you know, marital relations, you know what I mean, um, <laughs> with his missus during the daytime in Ramadan. So obviously he was fasting and, you know, yeah. should not have happened. Uh, and basically, uh, one of the ulama advised the Khalifa to fast two consecutive months as kafara, mm-hmm. yeah, mm-hmm. okay, uh, and another alim asked this uh, alim how he hit, how he issued this ruling, when uh, the khalifa should first free one slave, he should then if he can't do that he should then feed sixty people, mm-hmm. and if he can't do that then he should fast consecutive yeah. months, right? So what the alim answered was that you know what he felt is that if we had told the khalifa to yeah. um, First of all, just free one slave, yeah, or just you know feed sixty people. That this would be very easy for him. <clears throat> so it was against the interest because then you know if he did that, then he would have thought, okay, next time I'll just do the same mm-hmm. thing again. It's very easy for me, mm-hmm. okay. But this was rejected because the evidences that the second alim quoted, i.e., the fact that how can you do this when the clear uh, it's clear cut that if you do this, the yeah. first thing you do is free a slave, and there's a process. So you know this is an example that uh, if something from the text already exists, then you cannot have uh, a maslaha. You cannot deduce or arrive at one which um, is contra- in contradiction with the text. Yeah, and um, when uh, if you apply that to the discussion we're talking about, there are clear cut text. Which uh, we know that it's got, you know we cannot get involved in uh, a kufr system. The fact that legislation belongs only to Allah, and the fact that Allah describes the one who uh, implements kufr as a as a disbeliever, as a zalim, as a fasik. So th- these are clear cut texts. So you can't again. How can you start applying maslaha when there are clear cut evidence there in front of us? You know, it doesn't need interpretation. Yeah, and, and also with the with the issue of the the masla, what we see is that. Um, there was another kind, which is the maslaha approved by the sunnah, a uh, benefit which the sharia doesn't forbid. And some people use, uh, uh, they use an example, is they say that allowing people to trade, mm-hmm. um, this trade is for the interest of the people, and the Quran allowed us to conduct trade. Yeah. Uh, and uh, most of the ulama if not all agreed to this type of, uh, uh, of maslaha. But there's another one, which was adopting maslaha benefit in an action, for which there is no ruling from the Quran and Sunnah. And now this is the one which is uh, the one you can see people mm-hmm. are going down that route. Because the fact that if you're if you're going back to the Quran and the Sunnah, you guys have just mentioned evidences yeah. there which clearly rules out any type of masala on this issue. Yeah. But the two examples that they do give is the fact of compiling the Quran and cancelling the hadood during um, famine. The, the famine. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. And... Um, and the, the ulama that have accepted this type of maslaha, mm-hmm. the two justifications they give. The first, they say Sharia in general came to satisfy the interests of the people in the correct manner. Mm-hmm. Okay? Mm-hmm. And the second point was the Sahaba, عنهم, they agreed through the maslaha to compile the Quran without having evidence either in the Quran or in the Sunnah to do so. Mm-hmm. Uh, this is among many examples claiming that the Sahaba compile the Quran due to its benefit but without a dalil and you know what we can see here is that why this is dangerous the first point is that what did, what was one of the main points that Allah that the messenger of Allah uh, the messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam said uh, during the final uh, the, the final sermon, the, the sermon. sermon and what what is a famous ayat that people quote uh, linked to the final sermon the ayat about today. Oh, I have perfected your deen. Yeah, yeah. So today yeah. I have perfected your deen. Yeah. Exactly. So today I have perfected your deen. So the first point what we're saying here is that this masla is saying that you can use this when there's nothing from the Quran and the Sunnah. Okay. Okay. Uh, how can it be that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has perfected this? In, in the Quran, Allah also says that in this book is, a, uh, is an explanation That's for everything. Right. Mm-hmm. Okay, so how can it be yeah. that there's something which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not give us an evidence for? Yeah. Yeah. You know what? I think the people who do use this kind of maslaha approach, mm. 
it's quite emotional. Mm. So you you must have received lots of text messages and stuff going vote Labour because obviously Jeremy Corbyn mm-hmm. he's 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 not a warmonger like the others he's not going to go around bom- bombing other countries you know he's a nice guy and all of these things and if you don't so it's very much this kind of emotional let's let's do it based on the most potential benefit rather than obviously if the Tories come into power they're going to be you know. Or yeah. austerity, warmongering, Islamophobic, all of these things. So to the common person, it can be quite, mm. you know, easy to take, isn't it? It's like, okay, actually, that's quite clear. We do know that Corbyn is like much more softer on for Muslims and all of this kind of stuff. Mm. But it's, it's emotional. It's this yeah. emotional angle. And even those who bring forward this evidence of Muslah, they're not doing it correctly without, you know, they, they're, they're there's clear-cut verses, as you've said. And it's almost like putting those out of the way completely and going, this will benefit us in our current situation, even without taking into account things like it's like the socialist left or the left mm-hmm. liberalists that are pushing a lot of the LGBTQ type Which movements. Yeah, mm-hmm. It's those kind of ideas that are being fed into our children from the left. And this liberalism is actually as damaging as the right wing kind of effect on Muslims from an Islamophobic yeah. point of view. So this maslaha, you don't know what the outcome is going to be, is how bad it's going to be. So it could be slightly, you know, let's, if you were just going to be very logical about it and just thinking purely from our own limited minds, you might go, okay, that might lead to slightly more, less bombing in Muslim lands. Mm. But actually, at the same time, that might lead to worse effect here against our children in our schools. Yeah. So how do we even know where the, the benefit or the interest is going to be in our favour and now we're willing to carry out kufr, we're willing to carry out a haram action in a situation where we don't even know if the outcomes were going to be beneficial for us. Yeah. So again, the, yeah, the outcomes should have used. Because sorry. I think once we get this maslaha one out of the way, yeah. I think then we're going to go into those type of oh, issues. Sorry, because okay, yeah. because maslaha is still linked, I would say. I'm still putting it in, in the middle of the boxes. I.e. there's still some mm. sort of people who Islamic. give some sort of Islamic evidences. Mm. But what I, just to finish on this one, I mean, you guys have made it clear. But just to finish on this one, the two examples that they use mm. um, about the Quran being compiled and, you know, without any evidences and stuff like this, you know, from, from what my research and on what the scholars have said, is that the the Sahaba, for them to have compiled the Quran, normally that is known as an ijma, yeah. okay, and we can see that Allah Subhanahu wa Taala says in the Quran that you know, uh, lo, we have revealed the reminder, and lo, we very we verily verily are its guardians. Yeah, exactly. So you know, Allah Subhanahu wa Taala says He's going to preserve the Quran. How does Allah Subhanahu wa Taala preserve yeah. it? He preserved it through. The companions. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So this ayat is clear and also there's a hadith mm-hmm. of the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi when he said that there's no harm or harming. Yep, yep, so yep. from this the scholars have also said that what would have been a bigger harm than losing the Quran? Yeah, because yeah, even yeah. the discussion of the Quran being compiled happened after the Battle of Yamama. Mm-hmm, yeah? yeah. When a lot of the Hafiz of the Quran were killed, yeah. they were martyred. Yeah. Yeah. yeah they were Shaheed. Yeah. yeah? Shaheed. And the issue of uh, the, the chopping of the hand. Subhanallah, there's a clear hadith of the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam when he said there's no cutting in famine. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And if somebody was to understand the rules of the hudud, you can see that the hudud are not just the actual punishment, yeah. they have conditions. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. You know, and no one can be conditioned, uh, no one can be uh, have the hand chopped off yeah. if it's out of necessity. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Yeah? Yeah, yeah. Um so that example also goes. Yeah. So there are, in other words, what you're saying is there are evidences for all yeah. of these. So things. the maslaha cannot go against yeah, this because yeah. yep, yep, yep. It, it must have come mm-hmm. against the text which all ulama actually agree. the classical ones agree with anyway yeah um, it is a great it's, it's a very vital point because it's back to what you were saying that maslaha isn't um, our interpretation of what mm-hmm. is beneficial yeah. what we're saying here is that it has to be founded mm-hmm. within the text. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's exactly. not like because you can't make up what yeah, the benefit is. If you decided what the benefit subjective. is, you're still using your yeah. limited mind and your own biases yeah. of your previous information. Exactly. Okay, let's throw in some other ones, guys. Right. Yeah. So the 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 one I'm 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 coming across quite a lot. I mean, the ones that we mentioned so far are ones that I've seen people of knowledge, uh, scholars, or oh, yeah. okay, imams, shall I say, hatibs. Yeah. They have come out of this type of angle. Okay, fair enough. And I have come across people who have just said, well, uh, what about Yusuf al-Islam? But these are people who have not really understood it. They're probably going to a khutbah and yep. they've just heard it, right? Yeah. It's fair enough. Sound bites. Sound bites, yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, 
So you, credit is where it's due, where the, the other people have done their research and all that. Now yeah. let's go on those issues where are purely, I think, from just just, just whatever benefits you. Yeah? yeah. So for example, the less of the two evils. Yeah. What are we saying about that? So the argument here for less of two evils is that essentially, um, if the, you know, we, we there are certain parties out there, and there of those parties, there is one which will be le- you know le- least evil. So they will have the less, least harm on the Muslims. Therefore, we should vote for this party. What's, so, the, is, example, what's the Islamic angle of less of two evils? So, so there is an Islamic principle yep, of yep. less of two evils. And that principle is that where there are um, inevitable haram, you only have a haram options available to you. Okay. Yeah, you're in a situation yep. and the only options you have are haram. Yeah? Okay. And on that basis, you, are, you can assess what option will lead to the least harm based on the evidences again. And, and you you can do that. So you know you say least harm, least harm to society, or least like uh, like just say you had to you could steal a Mars bar, mm-hmm. or you could commit adultery as an example. <laughs> I mean the, the the two like one's a bit more, yeah, yeah. one's a lot a lot worse, isn't it? Yeah, so yeah. is it like in the sense like you you weigh up like which one is less sinful or which one has less impact on the society? It's more about impact on society. Okay. Yeah. Okay. okay. And and again, this is quite hypothetical, isn't it? Because when do we ever come into a situation? There will be situations like this, but it will be rare and few and far in between. But as an example, one of the, the really common examples used in this case, just to bring it to life, is that uh, of the story, it's not, it's not true, but uh, hypothetically the story of a man walking past a river and he sees a, a non matter woman drowning. Okay. And when he sees her, that he she's uncovered and she's about to die. Mm. Right? So no one else here there to help her, only him. So there's two options he has, and there's only two options here. Either he can carry on walking and let her die, yeah? Because he doesn't want to touch her. Because the, the second option is for him to touch her and see her, which is haram in itself. Because non mahram you can't touch a non mahram woman, right? Yeah. But the only two options is, is that he'd walk by, let her die, right? which is a, which is haram. You can't yeah. let someone die if someone's in front of you dying. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. the second haram is, he, or he could save her, but the haram he would commit is touching her and seeing her. Yeah. Yeah. Of these op- <laughs> options that he has available, obviously, the least. The least harm or the least evil is him touching and seeing her. Like because to, he, to, allow her to yeah, die. Allow yeah. her to die, right? Mm-hmm. So this this is an example used. However, now let's apply this back to where they use it for elections, right? So what they're saying here is that, okay, let's take the British elections as an example, right? That you've got the Conservatives who are a bit more right-wing, like you're saying, and a bit more kind of, you know, Boris like, Johnson... Yeah calling uh, our sisters uh, letterboxes and things like this, as you'd say actually is a bit more harmful for Muslims in the sense that some of the rhetoric that's used, right? Uh, then you have Jeremy Corbyn, who has some sympathy to the Palestinians and the Kashmiris, and mm-hmm. he's got some, you know, he's not as... He's, yeah, yeah, he's yeah. not. He, Basically, yeah. he's not Boris Johnson. He's, he's not Boris Johnson, and let's be clear, he's not. He doesn't have... I could clearly say he doesn't have more hatred to yeah, the Muslims, yeah, right? Yeah. Um, so they'll say that, okay, now it's okay, should, we should vote for Corbyn. But the fact and reality is here that there's another option here. There is another option, mm-hmm. right? That is halal, which is not to vote. Yeah, true. Yeah? So yeah. you can't apply this in this situation because one of the principles I said is that in, in Islam or in this lesser of two evils principle is that the only options available to you can only be haram. Okay. If there is a halal option, you take the halal option. You, they, then the principle doesn't apply. You have to take it. Uh, take food. You've got, you've got three food in front of you. One is... Haram chicken, yeah. One is pork, and one is uh, halal uh, meat. Mm. Yeah, you can't be like, oh, I don't really like meat. I'm gonna go for the halal chicken. Mm. Oh, the haram chicken. Sorry, mm. you can't because you've got the halal option to survive. So you have that. So basically, they're saying that if you went to a bro, if a brother invited you to his home, yeah, and he offered you uh, two glasses of uh, alcohol, yeah. And uh, one had 50% of alcohol in it, mm-hmm. and the other had 25% alcohol. Mm. Uh, basically, you would have to choose, well, not have to choose, but you would choose yeah. the 25% because it, it's got less alcohol. I mean, in if it. I had the option not to drink anything... I'd no, but there's obviously an option, because he's a dig- not a dictator, he's not a yeah, dictator, he's your friend. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so he's giving you two options, so yeah. what's the third option? Not to drink it. Not to drink not, it. Not probably it. the best option is say, listen, man, I don't well, do any of this type of stuff. Exactly. Yeah, I'm out of here. Exactly. In reality, yeah. In reality, yeah. But the point you're saying is the fact that yeah. You've got options, haven't you? You have. And, th- and this is the point. that That's why this principle is being used as a justification mm. without really understanding. Yes, it is an Islamic principle. No doubt, right? But where it's being applied is being mm. applied incorrectly yeah. because you cannot... This is, just doesn't fit. Mm. And I'd also take you back to my previous point is that you can't even work out the exact harm that... You know, like you say, you can... For example, 
Yeah, look at the US elections over the years, yeah? yeah. You had, there was people, first of all, pushing people to vote Bush. They yeah, did, yeah, they, yeah did. they pushed them. There was Muslim yeah. movement. There was like even a website like Muslims for Bush or something like this. Yeah, there was a Muslim movement to vote Bush because what was it? Al Gore was the yeah. opposition. Yeah, and they saw it as yeah. you know, wait there, this will be less less harmful to the Muslims. What was this? His his uh, vice pre- well vice deputy, whatever you want. To call oh, it. sorry, he was yeah, that's right. He was like a, a, a Zionist, Zionist support, yeah, so Lieberman yeah. or someone. Yeah? Yeah. yeah. So so the fact that that there was a time that. Muslims were pushed to vote for him. Then subsequently, when, say, the time of even Obama, it was like, oh, yeah, this guy's got Muslim roots and, mm-hmm. you know, this guy's the, he's the first black president, all of that, let's vote for him. So there's always this push towards what we perceived or people perceived as could be yeah. the lesser of the evil, even without taking into account that there's an option not to exactly, vote. Exactly. But say that, you know, say you had to vote, all of a sudden, it's how do you even know? Look yeah. at Obama was, the under Obama, more Muslims were bombed yeah. and more drones were put out in over Muslim lands than any other previous um, president. Through so, Blair in there as well. Through Blair in there as well. Muslims yeah. were pushing to vote for him. Exactly. So this whole angle that all of a sudden, just because from the apparent, it looks like Jeremy Corbyn and Labour might be in some way slightly better for yeah. Muslims from a purely beneficial level, from a purely yeah. lesser of the evils levels. You don't know. You don't know. And that's another condition of this, that it's very clear and imminent. Like it's right in front of you. You're cl- With the example you used of the woman drowning, it's clear. Yeah. It's very clear what the likely you can is. judge you can straight save, away. Yeah, you can save her. You can't. You might let her drown. In this case, you don't know the outcome. Exactly. So you yeah. need to know the outcome. Yeah. What if voting Labour in yeah. results in your children become becoming homosexual exactly. and supporting LGBT and becoming liberal? Isn't that harmful? It is. It is. It it is. is. Definitely, yeah. So, uh, and also, there's a there's a quote from uh, Imam Ibn, Ibn Taymiyyah, rahimahullah, yeah. when he said that the Sharia has been revealed to obtain all possible benefits and to prevent as much harm as possible and reduce it. Yeah. Its aim is to produce the best possible scenario from two good options. If both cannot be achieved together, yeah. uh, and to ward off the worst of two evils, if both evils cannot be prevented. Now, exactly. I think the main thing there is, like you said, prevented. But let, let, yeah. let's throw another another one as well. The fact that you got option A, which is um, you got two options. Yeah. One is worse than the other. One is yeah. wor- uh, worse than the other. Yeah? yeah. And some people may argue that you know that third option that you said, which you said abstain, don't vote. Yeah. Some people may say that that's actually um, that is also going to bring about evil. More okay? harm. Yeah, More yeah, harm. Yeah. But, going back to Russia's point at the beginning, yeah. it's accepted that participating in a kufr system is something which is not allowed. Exactly. It's an evil, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So now just say, if you use the same principle of less of the two evils, or we're going to actually go to less of the four evils, yeah. okay, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, if you had the less of the two evils, where one is you abstain from voting, just say they made they said that's simple, yeah. and the other is performing an action which some people even claim is shirk. Yeah, exactly. Right? Exactly. Which one's the less of the two evils? Obviously, the one that not not performing shirk. Not performing at all. Yeah, yeah. not performing at all. And you know there's another principle. That other principle is supporting kufr is kufr. It is. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, so this is where you start to go, wait there a minute. That's what gives, you know, the options that you just gave on the table. That's what gives that not voting, even if someone was to say for a second that was sinful because you're not yeah. contributing in any way. Yeah. yeah, that the fact that doing that means you're not supporting kufr has to mean that's the best option, exactly. isn't it? Exactly. Because supporting kufr, what it says in Surah An Nisa, and it has already been revealed to you in the book. That when you hear the verses of Allah being denied and mocked at, then sit not with them until they engage in a talk other than that. Exactly. But if you stayed with them, certainly in that case you would be like them. Surely Allah will collect the hypocrites and disbelievers all together in hell. So you're supporting kufr. Yeah. You're support and let me clarify. When you, we're talking about representative democracy here, Mm -hmm. yeah? Representative democracy is different from someone going, you know what, we're going to have an election and it's just on whether women should be allowed to wear the hijab, Mm -hmm. yeah? For a second, assume, because that's a different type of democracy, and I'm not even saying that's correct, but Mm -hmm. representative democracy is different. Representative democracy is saying, I'm going to ask this person, I'm going to elect this person to legislate for me mm-hmm. in place of Allah. Exactly. In other words, I'm giving someone the bayah 
to legislate in Allah's position. Yeah. That's the rep- I'm not saying to him, oh, okay, you went, I'm going to select you just to vote so that women can wear the hijab. No, yeah? no, you can't it's, pick and choose. I can't pick no. and choose. I'm actually setting someone the right to legislate. All of a sudden, I'm mm. putting someone at the pedestal mm. of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And I, therefore, I'm supporting kufr. Yeah. And this is why that option of not voting, even if someone was somehow to argue that it was a harm, sorry, it was a lesser of an evil, I would still, you know, I would choose it. Yeah, exactly. Yes. And, and shirk, like we're talking about shirk here, and the shirk is the evilest of... Evils. <laughs> evils that are non forgivable. Super evil. Super evil. It's not forgivable. Yeah. So, how can we now put this in the part yeah. of, oh, actually, it could be, you know, it could be not the least? Yeah. And this is links in, and just to shortcut it a little bit, because there's another principle that, that people use is, you know, when we say actions are based on their intentions. Yeah. Yeah. So, even this idea that we might not intend for evil to happen, mm-hmm. sorry, we're, we want to do something because um, let's hope for the best, and I'm, I'm not, my intention isn't. Yeah. That I'm voting because I want to make someone else the legislator. Yeah. But actually, that in itself is saying that you can't make a sinful action halal all of a sudden exactly. just because your intention. It doesn't work like that. You know, you can't go, all right, I'm going to get, you know, if there's a bank robbery happening, I'm going to get involved in that bank robbery. But then at the end of it, I'm going to use that money to go and, you yeah. know, help the poor. It doesn't work. You can't make a sinful action halal. halal. And, and that is sort of stretching it but people have said that and actually there's a, and you'd be surprised that you know our great ulama in the past you know, there's a, a saying by uh, Imam Al-Ghazali rahimahullah mm. when he said uh, he said the sins they do not change their nature by the intention mm. so the ignorant one must understand that from the general generality of his saying peace be upon him i.e. what the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wasallam said actions are based on intentions then thinks that a sin can be turned into an obedience by a good intention, such the such as the person who backbites a man to please the heart of someone else, feeds a needy person with someone else's money, <laughs> or builds a school or a mosque or a military camp with unlawful money, yeah. while his intention is to do good. And so while he goes on, and if, if people want, I can I, we can paste this in there. But yeah. really, what he says is that even the issue of the intention, they fall into the categories of the actions which are allowed, permissible, etc. Exactly, exactly. They don't fall into sin. But another one, because I'm a bit wary of time, but I do want to go through some of these. And to be honest with you, I think the main ones we've we've explained. Mm. So these one we'll go through, and and this one is quite linked to the 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 one to do with the less of two evils, which is the benefit is taken over the harm. Mm. Mm-hmm. You know, and this one, Subhanallah, if you think about it, in a way, it's it's like that the the desires have become your your benchmark and the yeah. desires have become your criteria and when you when you are weighing up what benefits over harm is based on this but you know as for example Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran translation the meaning that fighting has been enjoyed upon you while it is hateful to you but perhaps you hate a thing that is good for you and perhaps you love a thing and it is bad for you and Allah knows while you know not and also uh, they ask you concerning alcohol and gambling say in them is a great sin and some benefit for men. Mm-hmm. But the sin of them is greater than their benefit. And subhanAllah, this is coming from the Creator. Because in some of these things that are being made unlawful, there may, may well be benefit. Yeah. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us that, you know, we don't know, Allah knows best. And an yeah. example would be is, you know, if you want to use the example of the benefit taken of the harm, it's a bit of a crude example. Mm-hmm. Uh, a bit more X-rated than you know, your swimming one <laughs> because she could be wearing like a, uh, a what do you call it burkini. a uh, burkini, burkini. Yeah? but is where you know a guy's walking and, and, and he witnesses and he sees a woman that's uh, uh, getting raped and he knows the characters and they're the sort of characters who you know after they will commit rape what they will most likely do is beat her to death mm. so what he thinks is you know what if I get involved in this rape and I rape her as well then what I can do is I can use this influence to make sure she doesn't get killed. Does that now mean that it's okay, it's lawful, because the benefit is taken over the harm, so the benefit here is to save her, Mm. the harm is to rape her, but the benefit to save, uh, you know, being alive is probably, well, from this point of view, is, is better than... You know, rape yeah. or I don't know where I'm going with that because yeah, yeah. you know, we, <laughs> I got some complaints, but you know what I'm trying to say. Yeah, yeah. But the point here is the fact that can you use that example? You can't. No, no. How can you say that you know, there's, there's something which is haram 
I'm going to do it and I'll get good from it. Yeah. I mean, and this goes back to this mentality point that because we're so dominated by the thought process of benefit and harm in everything we do, our own thought process has become influenced by it. Whereas our criterion as a Muslim is not benefit and harm, it's halal and haram. So any action we do is not about whether it's going to benefit me or harm me. It's about whether Allah has allowed me to do it or whether Allah has forbidden it. So when it comes to shopping, let's just say, I won't give as crude example as you. When it comes to shopping, the non-Muslim, his uh, criterion is what tastes the best, what's, you know, what's going to give me most pleasure and benefit. Whereas the Muslim is, at least asks... Is it halal or haram? Mm. As his first point. Mm, mm. And then after he you know, accepts, he understands that it's halal, he can then make a choice based on you know, where, where the, where, what his preference is. And this is the difference. Whereas with you, in that example, we know, every Muslim would agree that you can't do such a thing. Yeah, yeah. But sometimes it needs some of these crude examples for Muslims to realise that it is not, it's not about benefit and harm. Sometimes there has to be a bit of shock and awe, yeah, right? Definitely. And there's a few more, inshallah. Ta'ala. I think there's one which is uh, combining the good and forbidding the evil. Now, subhanAllah, this is totally taken out of context. I don't think, I don't think we need to spend uh, any more time on that. You know, we yeah. know that enjoying the good, forbidding the evil is one of the greatest actions that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has, has yeah. uh, described this ummah with, yeah. right? And this is obviously commanding the good is from Islam yeah. and forbidding the evil. So even if people try to say that, you know, um, if we vote for someone who's going to be uh, implementing less evil, then this is somehow enjoying the good, forbidding the evil. That's f- even stretching it would be stretching that, if yeah, you know what I'm trying to say. Yeah? You know, one quick point I do want to make on that one. Okay. I think it's very clear what you've just said. But what I will say is this is a side advice to people is... And is that we make sure we look at evidences from the classical scholars and tafsir and things. Because it's ironic that that verse, like you say, you know, to command the good and forbid the evil, and the many verses that tell us to do that, um, people are using those very verses that are, like you say, you know, so rewardable to be to be carrying out these actions. They're using those verses to push people to okay. make voting obligatory. Yeah. Yeah, whereas if anybody does a degree of research and they recognize what you know the context of some of these verses and what you are and are not allowed to do it's the complete opposite yeah. of what it's asking you know yeah. to actually use a verse to tell you to make someone other than Allah the legislator and use an Isl- a verse from the Quran to do that that like you say that's twisting it on some other level so the advice is whatever we say you know even like for instance Go and clarify that. L- listen to what we're saying and then look at the evidences and make sure what we're saying is correct. Yeah. Because people are using these very verses to promote completely incorrect and haram actions. Yeah, yeah and, and, and the, the last two, but I'm going to combine it into one, mm-hmm. um, is something which is definitely something which we need to highlight is the issue of the rura. Necessity. And what we would say in, uh, in Urdu is zarurat. But you saw LinkedIn it. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I have no idea where it's in Bangladesh. It's probably just... So what is, what is it? Zorurat. Zorurat. Uh, it's very similar. Yeah, it's, very similar. Yeah, yeah, it's, yeah. it's the same word. word. <laughs> Alhamdulillah. Yeah, so Zorurat, Zorurat, Dhurara, yeah. yeah. Dharura is, is, is similar. Necessity. But basically, it's to do with necessity. So some people say that necessity permits the unlawful, whilst others say that kufr is excused due to compulsion. Yeah. Subhanallah, right? So the issue to do with uh, necessity, compulsion, zarurat, darura, yeah. zarara, <laughs> is okay. What do you think? So the, again, the argument here is that um, basically what they're saying is that because um, we, if we don't vote. Um, actually, we're going to be. There's going to be certain uh, consequences of whether Muslims are going to be bombed and killed. So that means what they're saying is that then makes it a necessity for us to vote mm. because of this, right? But the problem we have with this is that necessity again goes back to the Sharia defining what is necessity, not ourselves. Yeah. So and th- this argument of necessity actually not is not just used here. It's used in very lots of different rules uh, where a certain thing was clear cut haram. But they use this argument to make it allowed. So, for mm. example, getting a mortgage, many people say, oh, I need to have a house. So it's a necessity. Getting a river-based loan for student. Oh, it's, I need to get an education. So and it's a necessity. However, we cannot ourselves define what necessity is. In the Sharia, it defines that itself. So it's about imminent death, imminent torture, your religion, your deen, uh, the fact that you might suffer a severe illness. There are certain categories, categories which w- make something a necessity, right? So this example here of um, we have to vote, we don't have to vote. It's, we're not being compelled to vote. 
you know, I haven't voted ever in my life in this country. There's no, there's no consequence yeah. in the sense that I'm no one's be, forcing you. No one's forcing me to do this. So there is no compulsion that makes it a necessity to vote. I'm not going to die if I don't vote. I'm not going to be tortured or anything like this, right? If that was the case, then absolutely that principle applies. If I was, some put a gun to my head and said you have to vote. And then, and, and I voted, at least I've got an excuse to Allah to say, you know, it was a necessity. You know, I was going to be shot dead if I didn't vote, and that's why I voted. Mm. And that, that's not the case. Let's, let's not kid ourselves. We don't have to vote, right? So that's why you can't use it in this, um, this, in, in this case. Mm. And then there's two conditions that apply to necessity, right? Mm-hmm. One is that it's most likely or imminent, right? That threat is imminent, right? So the fact that um, the, the, the reasoning given is that, well, you know, Muslims may be bombed. Um, if we don't vote for Labour, for example, then, the, you know, that might not happen. The, the reality is, like you said, you don't Blair, Obama, all these people that we've thought that are going to be less harmful to Muslims were very harmful to Muslims. So that condition doesn't apply because we don't know the outcome. We don't, and, and the fact is that the, the threat still happened after we voted. And the second thing is that the solution undertaken has to be resolve the problem, right? So if you vote for Corbyn, for example, then there has to be absolute likeliness that he won't harm the Muslims. But we don't know that. And the reality is, our experience is, that whenever we have voted, it has never led to Muslims gaining. And, and, and Bro, the, but the threat just, to, just to add to this, even the harm issue, yeah. I'll give you one example which will blow out of the water. Okay, so Corbyn, he, uh, he said that if he, if he was to um, uh, win the elections, then he will uh, recognise a Palestinian state. That's going to be... Uh, forget not even 1967 borders that's going to be on, on what few camps they are left exactly. how how is that something which is benefiting the muslims for for us to recognize that and not the entire palestine being part of for the palestinians and the muslims yeah and that's a brilliant example where just because there's a certain rhetoric if you look if you did a bit more research into the policies how is there any gain in muslims voting for a certain person that might be just a bit more liberal and then you've given some examples of LGBT and all of this that is going to cause more harm to our children. Yeah, there's a, there's a saying, you know, in um, there's also in uh, Arabic uh, yeah. compulsion, it's known as uh, ikra. Mm. Now, I may be saying that wrong because normally ikra, we see that. Yeah. That's ikra, isn't it? Ikra. This is ikra, so maybe it's compulsion. Yeah. But there's a saying of uh, Ibn Hajr, uh, rahimahullah, when he said that, and the conditions of compulsion are four. Mm-hmm. The first is that the one committing it is able to implement what is what is threatening with, mm-hmm. whilst the whilst the one being threatened is unable to rep- repel that threat even by fleeing. Mm-hmm. Okay. Exactly. The second is that it is his strong assumption that if he refuses to comply, then his threat will be put on him. The third is that what he threatened. Uh, w- the third is that what he threatened with is immediate. Mm-hmm. So if he says, if you do not do this, I will beat you tomorrow, he is not considered a compelled one. And, and, and an exception from that is he mentioned an amount of time which is very near or if customarily he does not backtrack. The fourth is that nothing is shown by the commanded one that would indicate that his voluntary compliance. Subhanallah. So subhanAllah, you know, what he's saying there is like, here, here is even saying that if he was to say, that uh, if he was to say that, you know, if you ain't going to do this, I'm going to beat you up tomorrow, that isn't compulsion because the threat has to be imminent at that moment. Exactly. Okay, subhanAllah. Right. So, uh, so to be honest with you, that was the angles that I've personally come across. If there's any more, then I'm sure our listeners will uh, get in touch. But I think what we need to do is uh, we need to bring things, uh, put things into perspective. And what I mean by that is we don't want this to this podcast just to be a can you vote, can you not vote type of thing. You know, there's a, a proper fundamental issue here, which not a lot of people highlight. So, you know, it's important that we discuss this, right? And this will uh, come out of the question where some people say, if you don't vote, don't complain. Mm. So what would you guys say to that if someone said to you, if you don't vote, don't complain? Yeah, I mean, the, the argument here is basically, what, we, what they're trying to say is that the fact that you didn't take partake in the system and you didn't partake in the decision making of who the ruler was going to be, so how have you got a right to now complain when certain policies happen? So when, for example, say Britain 
bombed Syria, Britain bombed Yemen, or whatever it may be, you have no right because you didn't partake in that process to have a right to complain. And you know what? I think the reality is we have to flip this on its head, in essence, because the, the reality is that we, um, the fact that we didn't vote was on, is on the basis of that it's not allowed to vote, firstly, and secondly, that the system itself is the problem. So irrespective of if you vote or not, it doesn't change anything, right? It won't change the uh, situation. We, Muslims continue to be bombed and the Muslims still continue to be persecuted. Just because there will be, might be some less harm to us like, personally and there'll be less far right, for example, that in itself shouldn't be a reason to, to take part in a, in, a, in a system that is made up of shirk, right? And I, I think um, we, you know, we need to be very clear that those... Muslims or any Muslim who doesn't get involved in the actual politics and the fact that we need to be establishing a system of life that we know is the right one, the Islamic system as we spoke about right at the start, then those are the Muslims that shouldn't have the right to complain because only through the establishment of Islam will justice be, will, will there be justice. And the fact that the the Muslims uh, w were being persecuted in I Iraq, in Palestine, in Syria, and all these lands, there's only one solution to this, and it's not through that democratic system. Exactly. And I would also do a similar way, I'd flip yeah. it, but on, to a different topic. I would say, what did the Prophet ﷺ do at that time? Subhanallah. Because did he take the opportunity to engage in the Qurayshi politics? Yeah. Did he take the position when he was even given the posi p permission, sorry, yeah. the position, position at that time? He didn't, did he? Yeah. So at the end of the day, anybody who says that you, if you don't vote, you haven't got a, a right to complain, would they say that same to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam himself? Yeah. No, they would not. No. Whoa, that's deep, yeah. bro. And they it goes back to the question we're trying to answer. Would the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam have partaken in the democratic elections? Exactly. Answer is no. And answer is no, and Clearly. because not just is the answer no hypothetically. We look back at the Sira, he and he had the opportunity, and he chose not to. And what did he chose to do? Choose to do? He chose to actually work for Islam to be established, so that that is the mechanism that would protect the Muslims, mm -hmm. even when Muslims were being persecuted at the time. You know, Muslims would yeah. you know being persecuted. We know the story of Yasser and Sumaya, yes. and yet. He didn't partake in... He could have thought, you know, temporarily, pragmatically, mm -hmm. if I take rulership, these Muslims, these early new Muslims, I can help protect them mm -hmm. by, you know, taking up a position in this system. But yeah. he chose not to. Exactly. He told those Muslims that were being oppressed and and who were dying that your, your destination yeah. is Jannah. Exactly. Yeah? And that's the way we should look at it. And we should have a look at it from that point of view of that... The difficult, the situation might be difficult, but as Muslims, especially as Muslims in the West, because people can say, okay, and there's the other, and it's linked to this, the other argument that, oh, you get the benefits of being in the West, mm -hmm. you know, you've got the benefits of being ruled by what's seen as a better kind of democracy, and yet you're not willing to partake. But my answer would to that would be, is I'm only here because of the what you've done in Muslim lands, destroyed Muslim lands, yeah. um, usurped all of our resources, put dicta dictators over our lands, forced your yeah. democracy into our lands and the corruption into our lands. If it wasn't for that, most of us probably would be there. Yeah. Rather than me feeling indebted to this society and this civilization as if, the, uh, you know, mm. they, I owe them something. So, bro, bro, the issue of indebted... Right. What you're gonna understand here is the fact that this is something which is, you know, just exaggerated because the first first and foremost when we when we look at ourselves in this in the West, okay, the reality is is that we came here due to colonialism. Yeah, definitely. That's a fact. That's a they fact. colonized the lands and they uh, took the wealth, you know, and when their countries needed that, that labor to you know, build it back up after the wars. Then we came here. Exactly. So first and foremost, the reality is that you know we are uh, sons of uh, children of immigrants, and we came here because the colonial masters said that we can come here and they can do this after they had raped the resources. Mm -hmm. They had raped the resources where Subhanallah, you read about India and the GDP and how the Muslims were living mm -hmm. there, and then Subhanallah, after all of that. And they call the the parents come here because they need it, and 
they give you a free bus pass and you, you, you people think like they're in Jannah or something. You know, subhanAllah, you have to put things into perspective. And this is the problem, Muslims, and again, this is why I don't blame the, the common Muslim at all. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because it's the idea that they're thinking that a lot of them are listening to what the mosques and stuff are telling them and going, you know what, oh, these guys let us pray, they let us build our mosques and all of these things. And if that is being promoted from the pulpit, obviously, to an extent, the majority of people tend to be followers. Mm-hmm. The majority of people tend to go, well, obviously, that's my place of knowledge. If the person who is studied Islam standing on the pulpit is telling me that I should be thankful to these governments, mm-hmm. then to an extent, if you don't think about it, you're going to be thankful. Exactly. But actually, that's why you need to question those people who are promoting those messages and where those messages are coming from mm-hmm. in order to completely ascertain that actually no we like you say we shouldn't be indebted to them we should be thinking wait there a minute we had our rich history we have this islamic economic system Mm. this islamic political system that will protect us we need to be doing something to bring that back and i think that even leads into the fact that some people will say okay if you're not voting what are you doing? You're doing nothing. Yeah. So why can you complain if you're not if you're doing nothing? Just to add one final point, I think then go to that question because that's mm. really important. Is the yeah. fact that the issue you mentioned about you know people being uh, showing gratitude and all that. Mm. The reality is Allah Subhanahu wa Taala is the one who gives rizq. Exactly. Yeah. He's the one. That, this is His world. This is his Earth. He's the one who provides. You understand, and 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 that's the reality of it. They don't provide for you. Mm. You understand, and on top of that, you know people work. We work. You know. You get rinsed when you pay taxes and stuff like that. Mm. And at the end of the day, no one's doing any favours, you know, exactly. So mm. I think that's something which also is very mm. important. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the, the one who provides man, yeah. you know. If these people stop providing, what do you think we wouldn't have any risk anymore? Exactly. 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 So but going back to your point about the issue of if so if you're not if you're not voting, what are you doing? Yeah. Mm. No, no, and and the re- the, I raise that because that's people's other more kind of stock answer isn't it it's like forget it. once you get uh, go aside the you know we would normally bring it all back down to evidence and go this is why we don't do it mm-hmm. we recognize that you know you can't make man legislator and all of those things but then the flippant comment like you say is often that oh you got all of the luxuries um, and then now you're choosing to do nothing i would i would say wait there a minute your one vote that you do every four or five years are you saying that that's something mm-hmm. that's the it's fact nothing. that you're doing that's, that's nothing. Not yeah. That's you doing your one vote in four or five years and expecting things are going to change. Actually, getting involved in the dawah, working to re-establish Islam, you know, working towards what the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam did, that is doing something. Definitely. Actually, putting one little ballot paper in a box that is doing nothing. That's tantamount to nothing. Yeah, exactly. And and you know you know the the fact that your question should. You know, we, we have laid it down, inshallah, and we've discussed certain viewpoints. And we've given the other argument as well. Um, and I think that in itself is khayr, because we're hopefully trying to advise the ummah of why this is evil and yeah, why we shouldn't be doing it, right? But at the same time, it's not a case of just saying all of this is haram and don't do anything. No, we're not saying that. If we take, you know, go back to the first point of this uh, podcast where we spoke about how the Messenger of Allah was a politician. He looked after the affairs of the people. He went about his life from day one recognizing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said to him, arise and warn. He went out to society, arise and warned, and he worked arduously to get that uh, the justice of Islam through the Islamic State in Medina. So if we, so the answer to that question is no, we should be doing something, but we should take the right actions. Because imagine if the Muslims now uh, didn't vote, because they recognize, I know this is futile, it's not allowed, it's not allowed in Islam and the Sharia mm. doesn't allow it, but actually, what I will do with my efforts is work with a true system mm. that is not just allowed, it's obligatory upon us to do. And and then through that, we will see that those things that we're seeking through this system, the fact that we're seeking protection for the Muslims, the fact that we're seeking Muslims not to be bombed to the Stone Ages that we find in nearly every single Muslim land uh, we can think of today. yeah, um, the, the fact that we can... Hopefully, inshallah, do away with, with this uh, liberal narrative of LGBT and all the evils that are, you know what, they're accelerating. Mm-hmm. It's not like it's just going up slowly, they're accelerating yeah. now. All of these would be dealt with through the Islamic solution, through the Islamic system. So if all the Muslims now recognise this and were to do this action, go back and study the Sira and understand how the Muslim went about doing this, that would lead to the most khair, that would lead to the true victory that we're, we're seeking from a kufr system, subhanAllah. 
And you know, I would add to that, which is, I think this is, it should really make people think, is to understand the concept of baraka. Because you know, you can carry out these actions one after the other, and you might even, like you say, use all of these excuses. Yeah. Everything we talked about today is like an excuse as to why you can do something which is not allowed. Yeah, yeah? an excuse. And we've said why actually they don't most well they don't have a ground to stand on yeah? yeah but all of them are excuses from not doing the thing that needs to be done imagine if like you what you've just described there all the muslims were doing that imagine that when you do something islamic when you do something that pleases allah that's when barakah comes whereas all of this time we're constantly looking for excuses of how to make you know pragmatic choices and actually doing things that are un-islamic Actually, imagine if we shifted and did the Islamic things, yeah. what barakah would be in that. Exactly. exactly you know, that. You, in the same way as a simple example, you wouldn't, if someone told you, here's some money, here's a thousand pound and there's no barakah in it, and here's ten pound and there's a barakah in it, you take the ten pound. Exactly. Even though that looks like a lot bigger yes. amount, you take what is, has the barakah in it. But we have been told that Islamic, that Islamic actions they are what have barakah in it. Yeah. Pleasing Allah is what has barakah in it. And maybe if we all turned around and did that, maybe our victory would come sooner. Bro, you know the issue of LGBT, the issue of your rizq and stuff like this. Yeah. You know what you're going to understand is that still, we're looking at this from a very individualistic mm. point of view because the, the thing is, and, and JK did mention about it earlier, that you know we've been influenced by this secular way of thinking. We've been in, influenced by individualism and, mm. and, and, and thinking, you know, where we're weighing up about... You know, an action is it going to be beneficial? Or is it not going to be beneficial? Mm-hmm. The reality is, is man, look, we are, you know, the Ummah of Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, right? Yeah. And the reality is, is that what was his mission in his life? His mission, his, you know, he after he had revel- he was received revelation yeah. until he died. You know, he worked for this deen. We see the the pious predecessors; they did the same, right? So the thing is, is that what we need to think about is the issue isn't about vote, haram, shirk and all that. Look, these things are very important and I think we've made a case. But the issue, what people have to understand is, look man, there's a war going on, there's a war in Islam going on. Mm. There's a war between the haq and the batil that has been going on since Adam al Islam and Iblis. And the point is that, you know, do you not think that these people want us to forsake our brothers and sisters in those lands? Mm. And just to integrate into this system, because if this system now catered for all our needs, man, you know, and all the benefits that we, yeah. we want, as not as Muslims, as individuals, mm. right? Then because, because there's non-Muslims that are against LGBT, exactly. right? So the point is, is that when we're part and parcel of this, of this system and this society, then our main problems... And whenever we come to think about issues, it's to do with, you know, my tax or, or this government mm. or this LGBT. It's never going to be about the Ummah. It's never going to be about working towards bringing Islam back. Yep. You know, in a way, we've forsaken the, mes- the mission of the Messenger, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, purely for our own benefits. SubhanAllah. You know, yeah. and it, it, may, it may sound harsh, but the reality is, is man, look, you know, the... the it's, it's funny because yes, there's you know we take the good from the actions, there's benefit from the actions, mm-hmm. but then there's countless ayat and hadith that say that Allah subhanahu wa taala is gonna test us with hunger, with mm-hmm. this and with that, and exactly. you know sir. So why is it we we can take the things about yeah every rule must have a benefit, yeah. and then you think about that benefit from your point of view, you know, from the shari point of view, but then the ayats about the hardships and about you know working towards jannah. We, we remove it because we want a cushy life. Exactly. Yeah. You and, know? I, and I think that's the main issue. Like, if you think about it, all these arguments that we've presented today, it's all, like you said, it's all about excuse, right? Mm. And I was just thinking about that, subhanAllah, that every single rule in Islam where there's been a bit of a clash with uh, the Western framework, we found an excuse. Mm. SubhanAllah, we've literally, like, if you go down the list of, okay, now think about your first house. Oh, we have to, you know, it's a necessity to buy a house. So, you know what? I'm going to take a bit of riba. Even though Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala clear evidence, the one who takes riba will be... But, but just to say, bro, just, just sorry to interrupt you, right? Mm. The point is, is the guy, he's feeling an agitation because he wants to buy a house. Yeah. He knows he can't. So, the option he has is, he needs to try to work because because he's, he feels a contradiction. Yeah. So he thinks that, look, I need to be living in a society where it caters for my, my beliefs. Exactly. Now, you know, Imam Bob comes on the scene, says, nah, man, look, you can have it, just don't have another one. Exactly. 
Th- that's it. That agitation's gone now. Because it's it's justification. I thought. And, and this is why it's related to voting as well. Because what happens, you know, as soon as you get involved, yeah, it's that forced assimilation. It's that now you're part of that system. You think that I've done my bit yeah. because yeah. you're thinking I can't do anything else. Now I've got integrated into that system. That's what they're trying to do. Because we, as we can see, you know, the non-Muslims are questioning this democratic framework. Exactly. Yeah. The non-Muslims. They don't are vote themselves. They don't vote themselves. Why? Mm. They don't see it solving their problems. Yeah. 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 Yet we're sitting there going, actually, oh, we'll assimilate. Why do they target us as minorities? It's because actually sometimes as minorities, they're thinking these minorities haven't realised yet that we're screwing them over. Yet let's target them and make sure they vote. Because you know what? Our populations, the majority of them, then they don't don't vote. It's to force assimilators in this society. And then we don't seek any other change. Yeah, Bro, let me just give you what makes my batteries about to die this tablet. It's <laughs> one example before it goes. This is from 1992. Okay, this is a speech from the mayor, uh, Michel Noir, if that's right, of Lyon. Okay, and they were, they were going to uh, construct a, a masjid in Lyon, right? And what he said was that he said that this mosque is going to help uh, integrate the 120,000 Muslims into French life. And in this statement, he said the proposed solution is to create a European form of Islam that that can coexist comfortably with the Western societies shaped by Christian traditions. We admire the civil traditions of Europe, its great principle of democracy, freedom and reason. We will give Islam an interpretation that is most adaptive to the U- European society. We will fe- no, we feel that our Jewish friends once faced the t- same uh, tolerance uh, we face today. Islam will be accepted as Judaism. They say it themselves, this is it, and sometimes most of us, because like you say, we don't yeah. maybe read into it or look into it, we don't realise they're yeah. trying to create a different version of Islam yeah. for us. And you know, the irony, what hurts me the most, is it's the same imams and the same mosques that are telling you all year round, don't get involved in politics, don't bring politics into the mosque, you know, all of these things, perfect yourself first before doing any type of political action. It's those same imams now are going, vote Labour. How, how ironic you told us to it's keep shameful. It's, it's shameful yeah. it's shameful isn't it so surely the ummah and the muslims have to turn around and go wait there a minute mm-hmm. all year round you're telling us not to bring politics into the mosque and now you're telling us to vote just yeah. question that for a second and question that imam and say what you're telling me is this even correct what basis are you asking me to do this and hopefully, yeah, as, um, as an ummah, we'll awaken to it. We have to be aware, because you can make excuses for some of the common people because we've been guided by some of these uh, p- people of influence. And you know this statement we said, right, this, like, just before we were just speaking about this, where if you don't vote, don't complain. My, my point, what well, I'd say the, the, the real statement is that mm. if you do vote, you, don't, you can't have no right to complain. Because you have voted for... In a system that allows the bombing of Muslims in the Muslims' lands, it allows all these liberal values to be, uh, you know, shared to our children, freedom, mm. liberalism, and all of this. So how can you now then, after voting for this, complain that oh, yeah. we're having we're being harmed? Yeah. Subhanallah, man. So obviously we're going to bring this podcast to a close. This is like a marathon podcast. I think it's one of the longest that we've done. I don't know how long it is at this stage, but what I will say is that you know. Uh, on the note of if you don't vote, don't complain type of thing. I think you just said it there. If you're voting for uh, a government that's going to bomb your brothers and sisters, um, you know, if you if you view the British Armed Forces as your boys mm-hmm. and they go and kill my boys uh, in the Muslim lands, and you know, how can you complain? The reality is, and I think I think uh, I want to cl- close on this point as well. What Rash said, and I think is one of the fundamental points, is that we always ask what do we think what do we think you know the point is is what does allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say what does his messenger sallallahu alayhi wasallam say what did forget what did he say also what did he do mm-hmm. right you know we can give examples of our prophet yusuf al-islam but the prophet sallallahu did something totally opposite mm-hmm. then how come we then then lean towards this the point is is that at this moment in time the issue is we need to go back to fundamentals we need to go back to our purpose in life. We need to go back to and build a relationship with, with our beloved messenger, sallallahu alayhi wasallam. And to do that, we need to know who he was, what his life story was, what, you know, what he worked towards. And then when we understand all these things, and we would appreciate that, yeah, look, we are in an alien situation. You know, we're not in a situation where we have Islam. We're not in a situation where, you know, the rules of Islam are being applied. But, you know, 
does not mean now we accept the status quo, does not mean that we accept this situation, does not mean that we nullify all the ayahs of the Quran that command us to manage our lives in a certain way. No, it doesn't. It means what we need to uh, exhaust our effort is to start thinking, how do we go back to that day? How do we go back to those days? What role do I play in this? You understand? If we can all think about the role I can play in voting for Jeremy Corbyn or Boris Johnson, if you can exert that much effort, then to not think about what role do I play as a Muslim, especially when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that he doesn't change the condition of a people that do work towards the change themselves, what role do I play? Why is it that we only become political activists when it's in our benefit mm -hmm. and the rest of the time we're happy with the status quo and we're happy with just making dua. And I did hear this saying on a podcast, um, Staying Woke podcast, so a shout out for them. Uh, one of the brothers said, he is a saying, he said, um, he said, Dua without action is shaitan's greatest destruction. Right? I thought it was quite catchy. But, it, you know, it's at the end of the day, you know, when it comes to our personal benefit, we become activists. When it comes to the deen and the ummah, we then just resort to Dua. You know, and uh, so, subhanAllah, I'm going to bring this to a close. What I would say is that, you know, we've, we've said a lot. And, uh, you know, this is uh, what we understand. And if we've been correct in, incorrect in anything, it's purely down to us. And anything good we've said is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we encourage everyone to, you know, come to on this platform, contact us. If you disagree, that's fine. It will refine and clarify our understanding as well. And uh, we do, we're do doing this for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Not for any brownie points and not to character assassinate anybody. But uh, if there, is there anything else you guys want to add? So on in that note, inshallah ta'ala, we'll end the podcast. Jazakallah khair. For listening, and inshallah, we will uh, see you soon on the next one. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu.